There are tons of studies on The Shining online already, and some of you may be sick to death of them, and that's partially my fault because I've put quite a few out. But rest assured, there is a lot of mind-blowing stuff in this study that you won't find in other videos or articles on the topic. I can guarantee you that. This is original analysis, so stick around and watch the entire video. You'll enjoy it. Here we're going to explore a major conceptual element of the film that has strangely been overlooked. How Kubrick lighted the sets in terms of themes. Given the title of the film, The Shining, surely Kubrick would have given quite specific consideration to how his film was actually lit. As we'll explore in this video, he put a great deal of thought into that very task, and it results in a movie that has a unique and complex form of lighting not found elsewhere. But first a little bit of backstory so that you understand just how technically skilled Kubrick was in lighting techniques and anything else technically related to it. When making 2001 A Space Odyssey, Kubrick and his special effects team figured out a system for overlaying multiple separately filmed special effects elements in the same shot in a way that didn't result in the excessive graininess that's present in other special effects movies that tried to do the same. The result is that 2001 has some of the cleanest non-CGI visual effects ever put on film. In his next movie, A Clockwork Orange, Kubrick devised a measurement system that he could reliably use to quickly find out how strong the lights needed to be in any given set. For his next film after that, Barry Lyndon, he achieved a technical marvel, filming several scenes lit by nothing more than candlelight. He adapted his film cameras to use powerful NASA lenses that were designed to detect the faint light of very distant stars. And before his next film after that, The Shining, Kubrick was also asked by the producers of the James Bond movies to light this huge set in their production of The Spy Who Loved Me. Their own lighting technicians, who were of course experts in the field themselves, had been having trouble figuring out how to light this place. Kubrick insisted on keeping his involvement in the James Bond production private, and so only a small skeleton selection of crew members were even aware that he came to the set. He spent a full day making all his calculations of where to place what types of lights and getting it all set up for them, and the end result is a very well-lit visual set piece. This is how good Kubrick was with lighting. And the published biographies on him are full of these kinds of stories. So by the time he got to making The Shining, he was more of an expert on lighting than most of the dedicated technicians in the business. And so with this film, he took his lighting skills to a new level of conceptual sophistication that goes far beyond technical efficiency. Lighting becomes deeply conceptual in this film. Despite its creepiness, The Shining only has three or four scenes in which darkness, or the absence of light, is used in a traditional horror sense. The dark haunted house thing had already been done to death in the genre, but Kubrick wasn't one for following trends, he liked to be original. So when the most creepy and horrific things happen in The Shining, Kubrick mostly does the opposite of the cliched dark sets trope. He fills his scariest set pieces with light so that we can see everything clearly. The Room 237 Hall, The Dead Twins, The River of Blood, all these are fully lit, in fact arguably overlit so as to highlight the horror. For example, the rotting wet flesh of the hag is sickeningly clear in all its detail, that's very unusual. And I think it's a major reason why this film feels so different to other horror movies. But that's just the beginning. Did you ever stop and ask yourself why near enough the entire Overlook Hotel is fully lit all of the time inside during the story? The Torrances are a family of three. They only occupy a very small part of the hotel. They only occupy one room. Most parts of the hotel would hardly ever need to be visited during their stay. So there's no reason to have all the lights on. And yet, scene after scene, it appears that someone has intentionally turned on nearly all the light switches. But as far as I can tell, there are only two scenes in which we actually see someone flicking light switches on or off. In both cases, it's Jack. Here in the gold room, and here switching on the exterior lights. So yeah, as a general rule in this film, the consistent overlighting of the hotel interior is in itself unnatural and therefore creepy. It's a subconscious effect on the viewer, of course, and subliminal communication is absolutely key to making a good horror film anyway. Now there is another incredibly smart and unique use of subconscious lighting creepiness in this movie. Lights that switch on and off by themselves between shots. And we'll cover that later. But first let's look at some other forms of lighting creepiness. One of my favourites is the lighting of faces in some scenes to look like subliminal skulls. Skulls are very important in this film. We get skeletons in one of the final scenes... 
and in the Kubrick archives there are lots of skulls in the conceptual sketches for the film's poster. There are also skulls formed out of lit windows and some of sketches of the exterior of the hotel and so on. And the pairs of white or cream coloured double doors that are in the movie, I think they serve as subliminal skulls if the archive sketches are anything to go by. In terms of how actors' faces are lit, Kubrick did it again in Full Metal Jacket. In this scene, the script describes the character expression as the terrible grin of the skull. And of course, bluish lighting here provides the pale skull effect. And same thing here, Wendy herself looking like a pale skull. And we get it here with Jack. It's very subtle though. The blue lighting from above is evident in the reflections on Wendy's hair. But realistically, that should be a tungsten light above them. Instead, it looks like the moon is illuminating Jack and Wendy from above. Note how the lighting angle casts big shadows around Jack's eyes, like we get with the hollow eyes of a skull. Now bear with me because there are other, more clear examples of this. Pale Danny here, in bed, he, well he looks dead with that bluish lighting, although he lacks the hollowed out eyes thing. Grady's face is lit here for the hollow skull eyes effect. I think that's why his face looks so odd here. I mean, the, the room is very brightly lit, and yet we have his eyes in such dark shadow. Jack has the grin of the skull after he kills Halloran, and it's even more evident in an alternate take that appeared in a TV commercial for the movie. And that's very similar to this moment in Full Metal Jacket, by the way. And my favourite example, the twins. Look at the paleness of their faces and the shadows around their eyes. It looks almost as if makeup has been applied to give their faces a more skull-like impression. And the same thing when Danny saw them in the games room. In both instances, light from directly above puts the eyes in shadow and creates a kind of skull effect. I think this is a major reason why the twins look so damn creepy generally. Let's look at some more lighting strangeness. In the aforementioned gold room, there's a mysterious light source that's already making the walls glitter before Jack turns on the lights. Where's that light coming from? Why is it on? This boiler room scene is kind of traditional, but I like it. It shows that there are traditional horror dwellings in the hotel if you look for them. Dark corners full of dust and dirt. But I think it's especially jarring for two reasons. First, it mismatches everything that we've seen of the hotel so far. And it's creepy because we fade from the brightness and colour of Danny entering room 237 to the dark dirtiness of this set, which is emotionally fitting with the horror that Danny is about to experience. The light in the background here creepily looks upon Wendy and illuminates a mysterious portion of the set. And we can also see a similar light top screen showing that this room is quite tall. Wendy appears to be under a very harsh spotlight from way up above, making her look vulnerable in this tall basement set with its giant industrial props. As the camera pans around, there's a dark, scary, subliminal skull double doorway there, and a hidden area to the left of it, where someone or something could be hiding. This set always gave me the chills in a traditional sense, but one strange thing is that she runs out and then we see her in this very rare instance of a hallway in the hotel with the, most of its lights turned off. This is a hall that is fully lit in all other instances in which it's shown. The darkness here matches up with the darkness of the boiler room, but was the boiler room ground level or underground? We don't get to find out. But she does pass a set of stairs here, so I suppose that links in with the confusing spatial awareness of the hotel, which I outlined in another video. We viewers are intentionally kept confused about the layout of the hotel to make us feel lost and confused. Another form of creepiness is standing lamps and table lamps. Now, this one's quite frequent. There's one in the bear scene. And by the way, look at the strange lighting arrangement casting stair banister shadows all over the place. That's kind of traditional. Entering room 237, we have a lamp reflected in two mirrors. Inside room 237, five more big lamps in the living room alone. Three seen here, and two more as Jack backs out. Who has five big lamps in a room of this size? It's not that big. So again, the overlook is unnaturally overlit. Too many lamps. In the bedroom, two more, but also reflected in the mirror, so that makes four of them. The one nearest to the bathroom horror is off balance slightly, how appropriate. This occurs again in the lead up to Jack chopping down the outside door to the apartment and then trying to chop his way through the bathroom door. Tilted lamp next to the bed, and as Wendy jumps up awake, 
the lamp is suddenly tilted more. Wendy looks into the mirror, and right before the zoom, there are, if we include the mirror reflections, four lit lamps in one shot. Shining indeed. In earlier shots of the Torrance apartment, check out the tall lamp on the left, tilted and casting gothic shadows. In this scene of Wendy pacing about, the panning over visual elements in the room is just as important as her dialogue. Look at the tall lamp in this corner, casting its jagged light over an odd corner protrusion. And then two more lamps, one doubled in a mirror, and the bathroom cabinet mirror tilted very specifically to reflect the main light in the bedroom. That's the tungsten light that was sneakily replaced with a blue light here. In the scenes of Halloran trying to make phone calls, a bright lamp illuminates a room in the back, and it's quite distracting visually, as if Kubrick wanted us to pay attention to it. And look at this. Halloran has no less than four big lamps in one small bedroom. I've never known anybody to put so many lamps in such a small space. Moving on from the subject of lamps, in the scene where Wendy reads Jack's manuscript and is then harassed by him, uh, we have a rare instance of darkness. However, the back stairwell here is lit from upstairs, and that's the place where it is implied that Jack sneaks in from. When Danny rode around here, that stairwell wasn't lit. So it seems to have been lit in this scene as an implication of Jack in waiting. In this shot of Wendy, the opposites upstairs are lit. And Wendy looks at the manuscript and we have two shots that specifically get the lit upstairs into shot behind her. The second shot emphasises uh, the section of the upper floor where Jack would have to go to in order to sneak down the stairs. After all, he may well have observed her from up here. And by the way, the utter silence of his approach makes him ghostly too. No creaking floorboards, no squeaking of shoes. It's like he just floats in. Now here's a really weird one, and I'm not totally sure how this effect was achieved. Bear with me because it's complex. The daytime lighting of the maze is bizarre. First, look at the sunlight angle and the weather condition as Danny and Wendy enter the maze. Clear blue sky, and the sun angle looks like it could be any time between, say, 10am and 4pm. We can see inside the maze entrance that the sun angle is high enough to hit at least the top couple of feet of any given hedge wall. Well, any hedge wall that's facing the sun's direction, that is. There's also an odd perspective distortion here. A bench inside the maze is positioned off-center so as to be center of the sunlight entering the maze. Why is there a bench inside the maze? We don't see benches inside the maze anywhere else. The maze map scrolls in and not only is it placed against a hedge wall or a group of trees that shouldn't even be there because this is supposedly the outside of the maze, and not only is the maze map illogically placed far away from the entrance instead of right outside the entrance where people could see it before going in, but the maze map itself is also in shadow. It should be lit by the sun here, but we can see on the grass that something else behind us is casting a large long shadow, and yet the hotel is way over there on the left. So it seems there's uh, an unnatural shadow covering this area, and specifically covering the maze map. But hey, that doesn't mean anything, does it? Come on. Well, cut to inside the maze, and we can see the arched entrance to the maze behind them, but the sun isn't shining through it, and there isn't a bench, by the way. The creepy music kicks in right as this jarring visual mismatch occurs. An error that instantly establishes that the maze has no reliable map. It changes between shots, as is well known regarding the top-down view being much more bigger and differently designed than the model version Jack looks at. But here's the really messed up and trippy part of it. We see a clear blue sky and a specific angle of sunlight from outside that illuminates the tops of some of the hedges inside. So a person who is exploring the maze from inside would have some sense of orientation just by paying attention to which hedges have sunlight shining on them. They could also theoretically, depending on the weather conditions and their position in the maze, use the presence of specifically placed cloud formations or even the visibility of the mountain or the hotel as a means of orientation. But when we see Danny and Wendy inside the maze at ground level here, there is no sunlight hitting any of the hedge tops. The sun as a means of orientation is gone. 
just like the maze map outside was hidden in shadow. There is also no visibility of a mountain or the hotel at any angle and the skies have changed from clear blue to a featureless white in all directions. It initially looks like the weather has instantly switched to plain white clouds, but there's no variation in cloud density or tone anywhere. Nothing. And even on a real white cloudy day, the direction of the sun is still roughly evident on account of increased cloud illumination in a particular direction, but there's none of that here. All means of orientation from exterior visual clues have been intentionally removed completely. And that's really creepy. Now I've read production reports that both indoor and outdoor versions of the maze were constructed for the production. And so I always assumed that this shot was filmed in an outdoor version of the maze. I also know that the maze architecture changes between scenes throughout the movie. But when I recently noticed the removal of sky details and the lack of direct sunlight in this shot, it really threw me. Has the exposure on the camera been turned up in an exterior set to uh, turn the sky into a plain white effect? I'm not even sure if that's possible to this level. But even if the set was outdoors and it was just an increased exposure effect, what about the fact that there's no sunlight shining on, onto any of the, the top walls of the hedges? It could be that some large barriers were erected to block out the sun's direct light on the maze. Or has this been filmed in an indoor maze with some sort of large lighting arrangements above that gives the whiteout effect? For example, a massive set of transparent or highly reflective panels hovering over the entire maze and lit from either below or behind to create a diffused directionless light. That would explain the lack of direct sunlight on the tops of the maze walls. I really don't know how this shot was done, but what I am sure of is that the resulting disorientation is deliberate and has been very carefully arranged. It's pretty awesome, isn't it? Consider the following shots. Jack approaches the maze. Light from the window is casting shadows inside the maze model and highlighting the tops of walls and the light direction is directly side on. 90 degrees of the entrance. Cut to the top down view of a different larger maze and sunlight is coming from a different angle near enough for precise 45 degrees, which seems unnatural in itself, and it's coming from a higher angle than it was in this view, which casts longer shadows. The entrance of the maze also had a very different sun angle to those two shots, suggesting that we're now looking at it upside down, or rotated 90 degrees, I, I don't know, but the sun has flipped to a completely different position. And when we cut to inside the maze center, we finally do have sunlight against some of the hedge walls and it seems to be at the same angle as here, but the shadows are longer now. This one must be an actual exterior maze set with real sunlight shining in and a faint patch of blue is present in the distant sky. I'll increase the contrast to bring that out, but if we do the same contrast effect here, the sky remains utterly featureless. So yeah, I suspect this one is an interior set, but this one is actually outdoors. These are some full-on Jedi mind tricks from Kubrick. Every time I think there's not much left to explore in one of his movies, I go back for a casual watch years later and I stumble across stuff like this. It's incredible filmmaking. Okay, let's explore the issue of deliberate continuity changes and how the Overlook interior is lit. This is a major theme. We've all seen those horror movies where something supernatural happens and the lights in the house start flickering on and off. But like with the cliché of dark, dirty sets, Kubrick opted to avoid that convention and do things his own way. In The Shining, lights do switch on and off without the living characters pressing any light switches, but we don't get to see the lights flicker on and off in an obvious way. Instead, they switch on or off between different camera shots for a creepier subliminal effect. Something feels wrong to us between the shot changes, but we don't consciously know what changed. The set that contains the most of these unnatural lighting changes in one place is the lobby area in the finale of the movie. Halloran has just arrived at the hotel and he wanders into the lobby and is killed by Jack. But first we have Jack limping toward the room. And pay attention to which lights are on and off. This stairway area is lit from above. The two chandeliers closest to Ullman's office to the right are off and the third chandelier is on near the reception desk. All other chandeliers in the room are off but three sets of double wall lights are on, two to the left and one at the back near the gold room hallway entrance. 
We can also see in the distance that two chandeliers are on in the Gold Room Hall. But we cut to Halloran in the Gold Room Hall and one of the two chandeliers is suddenly off. It was on in the previous shot. He enters the lobby. The double wall lights are now off, but they were on in this shot. The chandelier that was on has turned itself off and the one closest to Ullman's office is now on. And Halloran gets killed right beneath it. And there's a couple more changes. The stairwell Jack was stood in here was lit, but when Halloran steps in, it's dark. And as Jack limped his way past this hallway, the most distant chandelier was on, but when Halloran comes in, we can see at the far end of the hall that it's now off. That's the same hall that Wendy creeps down to find Halloran's dead body. We could just assume that Jack had time to limp about and switch off all the lights himself right before Halloran came in, but after he kills Halloran, four double wall lights have switched themselves back on. They were off when Halloran walked in. And then we have that scene of Wendy finding the body. Creeping down this hall, the first three chandeliers are off, and the distant one has turned itself back on. It was off when Halloran died. She sees Halloran's corpse, and when she senses the presence of a ghost, she spins and the chandeliers that were off here have switched themselves on, highlighting this particular ghost. Also, the chandelier under which Halloran was killed has turned itself back off, and the next one further down has switched itself on. The lighting is all over the place here. These aren't just mistakes. Kubrick is messing with our heads, sneakily switching the lights on and off between shots for a subliminal supernatural effect. It's a brilliant technique. This could have even been done without the film crew knowing. All he had to do was film multiple takes and tell the crew he was trying out different lighting arrangements in different takes, and then in the editing room just use the shots that mismatched each other in terms of lighting. And that way, only he would know that he'd done this. It's actually really easy if you've got the idea to begin with. There are other smaller examples of this occurring in the film. Here, Wendy paces about, and in the background, Danny's bedroom door is dimly lit. But she opens the door, and the ceiling light just outside the bedroom is now on. Sure, this gives an excuse to illuminate Danny and Wendy for the dialogue that follows, but that light outside the bedroom could have justifiably been on in the initial wide shot here. Another example, when Jack is backing away from the bathroom hag, the hallway outside is lit, and then he backs out the door and the hallway is suddenly dark. Similar changes happen in the exterior shots. Despite the overlook interior being generally lit throughout, even at night, in the various distant shots of the hotel, only a few windows are actually lit, which sometimes appears to include the very important Torrance bathroom. Kubrick even specified in his instructions to the locational film crew in America at the Timberline Lodge shooting location which lights he wanted to be on and off. <laughs> he was very conscious of lighting, even in these shots. But the closer exteriors we see in the film are a massive constructed set here in Britain. In these shots, there are strong floodlights at the very top of the hotel. I'm not sure why this closed-for-the-winter hotel would require external lighting at night, but the lights are there and they're on. And we could just say it's artistic license to have the hotel gothically lit so it has some character in the story from outside. However, the top floodlights are not present in the distant shots of the hotel, even though Kubrick insisted on specific window light arrangements. Note that also in none of the exterior shots is there light coming from a reception lobby area or a Colorado lounge area, even though both of those sets have big windows and those sets are virtually always lit. So it's like we're left constantly confused as to where in the hotel those big rooms are because they never shine any light outwards. Here, Danny slides out from the bathroom window, but when Jack is outside chasing Danny into the maze, that same bathroom window is now off and several other windows are suddenly on. The difference is visible in the wide shot of the snowcat arriving too. Also, as they drive away, the bathroom light, which had switched itself off here, is now suddenly back on. Now, I'm willing to take some of these illogical light changes, especially in the exterior shots, 
as simply artistic license to make certain shots more interesting visually. For example, Jack's movement here is more clear on account of passing lit windows. It also gives him a, a silhouetted look, which is great. But the unbelievable lighting changes in the lobby scenes, of which there are so many, those aren't just mistakes or simply done to make things look nicer in different shots. They're too blatant and too illogical. This casts a question mark on all of the weird lighting changes that are present in other scenes. In fact, we also have the lights being all switched on inside room 237. The door was open, the lights were on. Going with the supernatural narrative, it would be ghosts who did that. And Wendy running into the lobby to find all the lights off and the curtains now wide open letting exterior floodlight shine in. Is that an error? The curtains suddenly being wide open is an error and all the lights off? That's all an error? No. The sudden switching off of all the lights is part of the psychological effect. Going with the supernatural narrative, ghosts switch them off even though we didn't see it happen. Okay, that's the end of part one for this study of thematic lighting techniques in The Shining. And believe it or not, this is actually some of the most simple stuff. I have two more parts to this video in the works. If this part one that you've just watched is popular enough, then I'll upload part two as a freebie as well. So get out and share the video with as many other film fans as you can. If you want more Kubrick analysis in the meantime, then check out these videos as well. Some of them are free on YouTube, and the others are only available as paid digital downloads on my site the link of which is in the video description below. Later folks, stay free.